Good, 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 good. How are you doing? Yeah, I, th I think I'm getting to the, um, if you like, the key thing that's the problem is the definition of scope. You know, when you say to a to your dependency injection container, when you say add scoped, you, mm. you don't get a choice there. But right. what, you, what you can do is you hey, can... Chris. Hey, hey, Chris. Hello. So we should wait until we, we, we properly kick off and everybody's here. No, keep going. They'll join in real quick. And, you know, by the way, Chrissy, Paul, just like I told you yesterday, uh, Paul wanted to take the uh, standard discussions community kind of engagement to, to talk about, uh, actually, why don't you explain it, Paul, the the serverless kind of pattern that you want to do in a, in a one single infrastructure component. Start from the top. I know you and I talked about it, but this is a recorded session and it's very likely the person that's watching this is not around to hear especially the private calls that nobody knows what we're saying in it so you're gonna have <laughs> before paul starts i just had a nice surprise at the door hassan oh yeah you got it already <laughs> yeah uh, it's full but yeah i i, I owe paul but... one too <laughs> yeah. nice yeah I, i'm waiting for you to add a table of contents before i ask that question <laughs> <laughs> I think the standard, like, because if you look at it on GitHub, it has this kind of listing of all the links to all the sections. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the book's missing from what, um, you know, because I've been talking to uh, Callum about it. He, he, he actually went out, bought a copy, and he said, yeah, the only thing that really bugs me about the book is there just isn't a table of contents. Table of contents, yeah. Because sometimes, you know, when you want to, yeah, you want you want to look something up, right? So if I wanted to know something about, I don't know, orchestration services, it would be nice to know what page to go to. Instead, he has to just keep flicking through until he finds that section. Obviously, over time, if you get That's more how you get people to read all of it. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, I have to know, like, I... You know, I had to travel through time. Back then, in my time, they didn't have table of content. We just wrote things. Just wrote things. <laughs> Typical developer, lazy. <laughs> Lippy, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Hassan? Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey. It's good to see you, brother. Okay, so so hear me out. You know, um, uh, Paul has this crazy idea, right? If you read the thread on in the community, that's great. But he has this interesting idea, something that I want us to kind of chew on, kind of think about, you know, you know, the, 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 just something, something that's I, I didn't expect at any point in time someone could take the pattern of serverless architecture and bring it into a, a one single infrastructure component. The reason why I like this a lot, because it plays very well with the idea of fractal patterns, right? Like your your high, high level architecture across multiple distributed systems should inevitably match the smaller components in every component of these architecture that's what the standard is the standard architecture is trying to enforce this idea just like how nature is right so you see a a simple atom that has a neutron and a proton and an electron going around it in an orbit same thing in the uh, galactic system right in the solar system you have a sun and you have a moon and you have a planet you know the planet might be flat but that's a story for another day <laughs> I'm just missing around, just missing around. But uh, you know, we have we have a huge society here in in the Seattle area of flat earthers. It's hilarious. But anyway, Paul, you know, go ahead, tell people, tell people your idea, and try to keep it simple for all that's good and holy, please. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. So I realized that, um, and you know, I've had some feedback d directly in my DMs and things like that about sort of the nature of the conversation lately, and people have pointed out that it's this particular area of the standard is something that when you get into the, like the enterprise level of systems, uh, you're inevitably going to come across this problem of um, passing off stuff outside the scope of um, what we class as a traditional web or HTTP request. So the way that I've kind of started to think about sort of application structure in general is imagine if what you're building whenever you're building anything to the standard was mm -hmm. just like i could just new up an instance of that thing um and 
but do that from say like within a new console application. So you've got literally no code whatsoever and you go, right, I want a new orchestration service and I want the processing services and I want the, you know, the foundation services and then I want the brokers and I'm just gonna call that method. So there's no dependency injection, there's no requests. I just want it all to work essentially. Mm -hmm. So the next level on from that is, okay, first it works. Um, the second part of that is then, okay, there's, there's elements of that that intrinsically at the moment, because of the way that we design code, that the bulk of what we're building is, um, when we talk about like enterprise level applications, we're talking about web applications typically because we're talking about connected services usually hosted in the cloud we want to develop them offline so we want that ability to just spin everything up you know in, in, on a laptop say you know with no internet connection but then we want to deploy it to the cloud and everything yep. still kind yep. of work and behave yep. the That's same point. yep yep mm -hmm. So we end up in this scenario where we've got things like, for example, orchestration services, where um, we need to make some kind of authoritative decision, right? And the, the decision in this case is a security one. So I want to know, firstly, who the current user is that's asked me to perform this business operation. And then secondly, I want to find out in this business context, can this user perform this business operation? And what I'm finding is due to the way that current sort of um, ASP.NET, .NET, whatever the architectures are that we're using, the frameworks that we're sitting on, have these kind of sort of three ways that we can kind of instantiate things through the dependency injector. So we're either talking about like singletons, in which case we have one for the entire lifecycle of the application. So there's no concept of security really there because the assumption there is that it's shared for all things across the app mm -hmm. you can go transient um so when you add things transient you're saying hey every time i want an instance of one of these give me a new one mm -hmm. or i can say i want something scoped and i've come to the conclusion that the concept of scope is a very rigid thing and is a very complicated thing that generally within the dot net um, DI container just means request scoped. Um, now, through the API that we get through service provider, you know, I service providers interface, we can say, hey, give me a new scope. And then within that scope, we can say, hey, give me services. Mm -hmm. What I can't do is say, give me a new scope and use this authentication context. And within that authentication context, execute these things that I'm going to ask you for. And, you know, I'm, so I'm going to I'm going to say basically service provider, give me a new scope. Here's my auth context. Give me a new foo orchestration service. Mm -hmm. Right. Foo orchestration service. Do something. And it then behave exactly like I'm inside the context of a, a HTTP request, because a HTTP request, I have something like um a bearer auth token that's transmitted as part of that request. Mm -hmm. Or I have something like session state that is just implicitly behind the scenes is kind of wired up for us if we make like one or two key sort of framework calls when we're wiring up our application. So there's a lot of, if you like, intrinsic um, assumptions that we're making at the moment about like the way that our code executes. And when you start talking about eventing, one of the key things with eventing is the whole point of it is I go down my basic cul-de-sac of say dropping some stuff into the database. Let's say I've got like um you know an add foo request that's you know been called on my um, foo controller um, you know through the endpoint that I've wired up in my app. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get some foo um, orchestration service that's going to call into a processing, into a foundation, into a broker. Boff goes into the database. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then ultimately, if we're following the standard, we might want to say, hey, I've added a new foo, right? So I'm going to raise an event because I want to do some side effects to that. Yeah. Um, I want to do some you know, further processing. But that doesn't necessarily need to take place, that further processing, inside the scope of that request. So now I've got this problem where I'm defining who the user is based on something that's wired up through the request. But now I want to execute some further stuff 
and I don't want to do it inside the scope of that request, but I do want to be aware of what the original request was, so to speak, so that from that information, I can then say, hey, who's the current user? Do they have permission to do this further processing? And this, yeah. this to me has been kind of a bit of a headache for sort of some time now. I've had it in the back of my mind that um, there was going to be some problem. And what I've done is typically I've just avoided trying to solve the problem. So what I've done is I've, I've built my cul-de-sac and my orchestration service has done my basic CRUD operation or whatever. Um, it's prior to doing any of that, it's done, say, um, a priv check or roll check or something to say, hey, can this user do this? And then it's raised the event and everything in the handler and beyond is effectively unsecured. I don't do any security checks because I know I'm going to be outside the scope of that request. So I'm not going to have that information available to me. So as a result of that, what I'm doing is I'm inherently doing something that I think Hassan would say is probably anti the standard because every service should be responsible for its own sort of incomings and outgoings. And if there's some security that needs to be assessed, um, then I think that, you know, when I raise an event, the source of the event um, should, if you like, if the source of the event knows this, this security information, that should be transmitted through the event. So if, when I raise my event, I go over service bus into another, say, instance of the app running on another server. There's still effectively some sort of request, if you know what I mean. But it's not a HTTP request. It's an event request. Uh -huh. So when we talk about this concept of scope, if I'm talking about scoped services, for example, like um, uh, if, I, if I add um, HTTP context accessor to my um to my application so that i can get that information from the request mm -hmm. what i'm basically saying is hey that's a scoped service so anything mm -hmm. that depends on it must happen within a request scope but the problem is my authentication provider demands that that information is available and on the other side of an event on the other side of service bus on another server somewhere i don't have a http context I've got some trigger that's happened over potentially, say, a binary socket. So, so, so <laughs> let me just so let me just tell you this. Um, in in usually in distributed systems, you know, you're you're not necessarily sharing. I think there is there is a way that. Okay, let me let me kind of visualize this first. You know, there is there is an idea in distributed systems where you basically go and say you cannot. Or you, or you can't rely on a certain context to be shared and distributed across multiple systems. What that basically means is that assume that you have this microservice, these bunch of microservices sitting around like this. I'm talking here about distributed systems, Paul. So this is where we already left the one ASP.NET Core service and we're working with other services. And in between these services, you have a bunch of queues sitting around right so these queues are sitting here and they're sending kind of messages to each other some of it is direct communications some of it is queue based and so on and so forth you have to know this you can transcend downstream auth from one service to another so microservice a microservice b to c and d between between b and c yeah you can probably transcend you know the the token you can basically go in ASP.NET core and say you know pass in downstream token to the next service right which is great but the question here is how would you do it in something like this if you have a queue sitting in between these things in this case here just a thought that i have why don't you just rely on that you know, microservice A, actually, let, this this is a bad example. Let me put, put that in here. Hold on. So if I take this and put it in here. So did microservice through, A. Yeah. I was going to say, did you want to go through my diagram? Because it's it's much simpler, but yeah, it's yes, the same but, problem. <laughs> but but just hear me out. Just we'll, we'll go to it in a second. But just hear me out. You may be able to transcend your auth from A to B right but once b took that request it 
the request became on behalf of B, like the user is gone at this point in time. You know what I'm trying to say? Like the fact that A was allowed to communicate with B, A is baking in the fact that B now is going to be representative of that request, irregardless of who the user is. Yeah, so I kind of look at it like, um, to, to my mind, I don't know any company that um, builds infrastructure in such a way that they effectively trust an external single sign-on provider, essentially. like Everybody right. does their own authentication, essentially. So right. my thinking is if I have a set of applications or if I have one application and I have multiple instances of it, then my own single sign-on um, service is going to provide me the user ID in all of those cases. So if I raise an event on application one or in context mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. and I say, hey, the single sign-on user ID for this um, request is this, then in theory, I should be able to transition that into context two flawlessly. Because all of that, as far as I'm concerned, is internal. And this is one of the key objectives that I want to if you like, produce from any kind of single sign-on um, implementation that I provide to the community. I want to be able to say, hey, if all of these applications or instances of applications are wired up to the same provider, when given something that's um, inherently, if you like, provided by that thing, it's, it's considered to be trusted and authoritative from that source. Um, so I'd, I'd be less reluctant to pass around, say, user ID and more um willing to pass around something like an authentication token so each service will have to go back to that authority and say hey is this thing still valid and if it is who does it represent so there's still a check taking place there but i do want to be able to say hey you know service a gave me this auth token and i'm now service b trying to process this request so i want to transition that um if you like authentication information that is associated with that auth token um, when I'm doing my own processing. The, the, the auth token that it received or it generates its own? So it, it so tokens are issued to clients, essentially. Right. right? And, and you're so, using it to access a certain capability, right? Yeah. So the way that I'm kind of looking at it, and I might not be quite right on this because um, in the grand scheme of enterprise things, I think there are a lot smarter people than me out there. But the way that I look at it is if I'm customer A and you're the service provider, right? Mm -hmm. I go to your API and I say, hey, here's an authentication request. You give me back an auth token, okay? Mm -hmm. I take that auth token and I associate it with another request and I say, hey, here's a file. Go process it, mm -hmm. okay? What happens is your service A picks up that file, takes that bearer auth token, figures out who I am, authenticates that I have permission to do that, drops that file into a system somewhere, right? And then says, hey, I'm raising an event. System B then goes, okay, great. I'm going to go and handle that. I'm going to do some further processing. Right, right. Who's the user? So the way should that it, I see it. ask that question? Should it be asking that question? I think it should, yeah. Um, and I think ultimately the, the way that it should be done is if you have, for example, um, let's say I have a set of two applications that are paired up and the only link between them is um, an event hub or service bus type implementation, right? App one is external and app two is internal. So nothing from the outside world can call into app two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, whenever something happens on app one, um, it has to happen in an authenticated scenario. So I have to have a bearer auth token. But mm -hmm. events raised in app one can be given to app two for it to do further processing. Mm -hmm. App two shouldn't just blindly follow instructions from app one. But what app two should do is it should say, hey, give me some authentication context here so I can make a decision of whether or not within myself this user has this right to do this particular operation. See, the problem is that if you queue these requests, you've already lost, you know, the ability to time out a token because mm 
the whole idea of cues is, or even like like when you say events assume that i will come at some point in time and say hey this Levent library now has the capability that you store your requests in case your entire app goes down. So if you're storing some sort of information about a, about a token, well, you're not saying a token. You're basically saying, no, I'm not putting a token. It's just for that particular user. But any, anybody could impersonate that, Paul. Do you see the security risk with, risk with that? Like the whole so idea. Are you, are you thinking that like, so it, it in my scenario where I've got app one talking to app two, then the common link between them is is some queue that's set up through a service bus implementation. Right. I'm working on the basis that my service bus endpoints are secured. And the yes. only thing that has access to that are the yes. applications that I've decided should have access to that. That's correct. So so there's no um, there's no external callers saying, hey, I'm claiming to be admin. And right. I'm making this request on this queue. Right. There's there's an external app that has an external endpoint that, right. that callers can say, hey, I'm claiming to be this. Here's my auth token. But then what happens is the externally facing app says, OK, using that auth token, I'm going to go and ask single sign on who you actually are. Right. And from then downwards into your distributed system, it shouldn't be it shouldn't care about that token anymore because you're going to drop it on a queue. It's not going to work out. You know what I mean? Sorry, 20 questions from the door. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, you know what? I yeah. Was so uh -huh. what, what I think is, let's zoom in on this diagram here. So it all begins with an auth request, right? right. So typically you're going to have some something external to your business. They're going to ask, hey, I, I want to log in. I want, I want auth information that... Right. I consider kind of a bearer token as being what I would class as something um, I refer to it as the security context. So within within the context that this bearer auth is associated with, I'm performing an operation. So right. it's another way of saying, as this user, I want to perform this operation. Right. So essentially what happens is, and you're getting a very simple sneak preview here of what I've kind of started building out with, with single sign-on. But essentially, there's an authentication request that comes into an account controller. Mm -hmm. The app hosts this account controller, okay? And there's a coordination service that lives in my app that's wired up to various um, services that are business context specific. Wait, 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 wait. Why are your coordination services talking to processing services? Um, because at the time I, I wrote this diagram, and things have changed, so don't worry. <laughs> um, there wasn't a need for orchestration services sat on top of these things. I think there may actually be orchestration services on top of them now. So okay. it's a bit more, yeah. Um, but not to call you out, but I like to kind of <laughs> call you out. <laughs> Don't worry. It's more consistent than you think. I normally like brainstorm ideas and then I refactor them and I go, right, okay, now it's a sand worthy. But for some reason today, I've been lazy. Uh, <laughs> So essentially what happens is in my app, I've built this coordination service that sits on top of my single sign-on authentication um, service, which is responsible for managing users, sessions, tokens, essentially. So when a login request comes in, it, it takes that user ID and uh, passwords that's been uh, provided to the endpoint, essentially. And it goes and says, hey, is there a user that sort of matches these details? And if there is, great, I can put that user into, for example, the current session, and I can put the auth token in session. So now I've got this information freely available for anything that has access to the session, if I so want to. Um, but I can also then go to my token processing service and say, hey, give me that token, right? And I can pass that back up the chain through the controller and respond with that token. Mm -hmm. So from here on out, I'm assuming that token is valid for the duration that it's valid. Now, you raise an interesting point about the life cycle of tokens. I think that there is some um, there's some valid context here for us having something in eventing that's potentially um, token expiry aware, shall we say. So if, a, if the queue is being worked on, maybe there should be a queue processor or something that says, hey, there's tokens in this queue that are due to expire. What I'll do is I'll just renew them. No, 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 no. Let me stop you. Nope, 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 nope. Especially okay. if their user token, one second. Mm -hmm. Especially if their user tokens, you can't, you can't renew them 
without a user consent. That's hacking. Do you understand what that means? It means that yeah, that's fair. You're, you're basically so, saying, let, let me just tell you a funny story. And then, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the problem with this is that, and I know my camera is off, you know, um, um, there is there is a problem with a, a you know when you're if you do that Paul that means that you can impersonate any user and act on their behalf without their consent on the system now um, uh, I would say that uh, another user can't do that but the system essentially has ultimate control nope, and not it even does the what when nope not even the system if your system can do it then your engineers can do it and if your engineers can do it then they can impersonate and that's a huge massive security problem let me tell you what what google does just and some other big companies right there's something called silent token refresh but this silent token refresh has to ensure that the user is still present they don't pop up a login page but they go and say hey you're still editing this google doc right or outlook you know thing on the web so you're still around right. right if you go and say oh no there's a mechanism where i can renew this token despite the fact that the user have already gone this is these are the hybrid situations say online offline you're in a hybrid situation the user was online but then they left right again like i said to you in distributed systems what people do once you start hitting cues or hitting uh, events or something that is eventually will be consistent, you already lost the user. The user is gone, and now you're acting on behalf of the service that initiated that queue message or event. That's it. So you're saying in the context of an event handler, there's, n there's no way that I can realistically ask who the current user is because it never makes sense because I've lost the context of that request. It, it will work so well for you within the one component, the one microservice, because you're still within the session in a way. In a way, you're you're in a session, right? But how do you fractal pattern that? Like, how do you take that and work on it across multiple microservices? Because now you don't have that, you know, singleton startup CS that basically tells you, oh, by the way, the current user is X, Y, Z. Now, granted, to your point, you're saying instead of having the broker that the, the services go to, that they go and call this broker and say, who is the currently logged in user and what's their auth? You're basically building this authority, which is an independent, isolated component in your microservice or distributed architecture that you that your other services go to and say, hey, who's the currently logged in user, right? But what are you going to do if you put a message on the queue and the, the service that's listening to that queue died? It's down. So the message is just sitting there waiting for the service to come back up. And then 24 hours later, the service is coming back up. Are you going to renew the token, the token on behalf of the user? That's hacking. Right. So th it. this is why um, when I went down this path of passing the to token around, Callum right. internally suggested exactly this problem, right? And he turned around and said, well, why don't we just pass the single sign-on user ID in? Because then when uh, the auth broker says, who's the current user, we've still got the ID. So on the other side of the event, we can, within the handler, for example, mm. we can go down to a, a, an authorization broker and we can say, hey, scoped dependency injector, tell me who the current user is. And that will mm. then return from the information from the event who right. the current user is, regardless of any token. And, and I thought that was a perfectly valid way to approach the problem because then you only need your token to be valid for the, if you like, the context of a HTTP request, which is always a very short lived thing. Mm -hmm. And this can also help to resolve problems like, for example, I've got, you know, after I finished all this B2B stuff, right. I've got to rebuild my workflow engine to the, to the standard as well. Now, if you consider how workflows work, um, I've con constantly had this misconception amongst the community of developers. This is a good opportunity to point this out, right? There's a difference between an orchestration engine and a workflow engine, and not many people know this. So an orchestration engine just calls into child services and lets them do things, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A workflow engine is responsible for orchestrating an entire flow. So potentially you could be responsible for an entire business process 
of which partial pieces of that business process might be to wait for people to do things right. such as approve um, or make decisions on things, in which case you're not ever sat within the scope of a single API call, for example. So when you execute a workflow and you want to wait for, say, a user approval, that might take, say, a couple of days. How do you pick up security information from that point on? So you have to be very aware of like who's doing what and in what security context. So workflow is a classic example of the most complex nightmare of a headache that you're ever going to have with regards to like figuring out who's who and who's doing what. We we have we have by the way just so you know the fact that I'm telling you this it doesn't mean that I'm happy with it I think we need to hmm. I think I think security is too complicated I think it's very hard for people to understand security and it needs to be simplified and beautified I also think okay. that we need some way Paul I think I think Crystal might might agree with me on this you know I think you're headed in the right direction in terms of the the single sign on open source component we need enough tooling and ecosystem around this that makes someone who just graduated college didn't even graduate computer science school that can actually build a truly secure system by just calling a couple of methods it has to be that simple it needs to work like an appliance right yeah. i'm not saying i'm just telling you how enterprise systems are developed today you don't carry the user token around you can't do that right in fact actually you You'd get audited to death if your <laughs> system proves that you have something like that. A risk team or a security team would literally grill you for something like that. But uh, I don't know, Christy, what do you have to say, if anything? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, in my mind, I've got this, the, the process is, is, is a lot simpler. Um, I would see uh, the user come in uh, with his uh, bearer of token. Um, you'd have your... Uh, Claims principle present on your HTTP context assessor. Um, and then from that point, I think you can just hand over the claims principle to your services. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to validate it beyond that point because you've already verified the user. Um, and then in my mind is when you go uh, across that line to, to do that um, right hand process, I think. Um, in my mind, you've got everything needed to, to, to continue the flow. Um, you, you don't have any expiry information. The thing that immediately came up in my mind is if you ever need to do replays, uh, that, that process will fail immediately if you start looking at your um, off tokens expiry information. So, um, and when Paul said about approval process, um, when, when, when the request came in, the user that submitted it, um, was validated, it went into the queue. Yeah. Um, in the same way, when it comes to approval process, when the person that approves that comes in and say, I'm, I'm approving, he's gonna have a separate off token, which is valid at that point in time. And you you can basically just do your logical validation on your queues to say, is this user in the right role? Can I do the operation and then continue? I don't think you need to do the SSO bit again beyond that. And, and, and in my mind, if you just pass on the, claims principle between all the microservices you still sorted because um, at the time of entry you you had all that information i almost see that in the event you almost have a, 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 a wrapper object one which is the entity that's being passed in and the second element is your your claims principle um, because from that claims principle you'll you'll get your your user information which you don't need to validate again but you've got all the claims and all the roles on that as well so, so basically, once you started putting something on the queue or an event, you already decided, you already declared the process to be an offline process, and you know the user is not present anymore. You lost the user from that context. Yeah, and and your your security, as Paul also said, is uh, your your service message bus will, will be secured. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you'll validate uh, is the sender uh, a valid sender and that kind of thing. So, um. I, th I think from from that point of uh, you you pass the SSO then. How, how do you feel about so, that, Paul? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's. For me, it's about being able to be consistent in the in the code base, right? So if I have in in here in my, in my uh, in my request, if I have mm -hmm. an authorization broker that's going to mm -hmm. make some kind of decision, you know, I'm going to ask it a security question, right? 
when I go through an event through service bus and, and pop out, you know, an event up here and my management service then starts calling down into things and eventually hits an authorization broker down here outside of a, a request. It needs to be consistent. Yeah. It needs to give the same response. And I yeah. don't care how that's achieved. What I care about is that one, it's secure, obviously. And two, I can, I can reasonably say, do I trust this link is essentially what it boils down to, right? Let, let me ask you something. Okay, I struggled with this problem a lot, by the way, just so you know, like, I thought about this a lot, right? And one of the things that came to mind were, once you've went on the service bus hub, the user that you're trying to get is not the original user anymore, it's the service user. Would you buy that? Um, so in our case, um, let me give you a typical business scenario that I face every day. Actually, right? actually, wait, wait a second. One second. Just one second. I'm sorry. To, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. When you go into the post office, right, and you put in your mail and they verify your ID and you verify anything, from now onwards, it's not you who's presenting the mail. It's the worker that's in that post office that's talking to other workers by himself that says okay trust me i already authorized this user now you have to deal with me i am the person that's but but what's the scenario that you're dealing with go ahead go ahead go ahead i see i get what you're saying but by that definition is every http request beyond the controller is not the user it's some control has been taken by the application itself. So therefore it's being performed as the user. Um, yep. and what, and, what and, I'll do is I'll give you some, I'll yeah. show you something. Um, <laughs> What's this lonely icon that's sitting at the top right of your screen? <laughs> this. Is that the game? Is that the game? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a benchmarking tool. Um, oh, nice. Nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so if I look at um, all is weird, <laughs> he just does weird things. <laughs> just do weird things, yeah. Uh, wrong diagram. Because we're supposed to be consistent, right, Paul? Your every service for itself, every yeah. service is supposed to be. That's that's what I'm struggling with, uh, Cristo and Felipe. Like that, like we're saying that every service is supposed to be self fulfilling. Okay. So way. here we have, right, this this box, this gray box at the top here represents my workflow engine, okay? Right, right. Assuming at this point I have a file and I have a request to perform a CSV import, okay? And uh -huh. I'm going to pass down this request line, I'm going to pass a bearer token, okay? Right. Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to hit a CSV line controller. The controller is going to go down through the chain and hit the database with those line items, essentially, right. okay? Once those line items are in the database, I'm gonna raise an event, and I'm gonna say, right. hey, these line items now need processing, right. okay? Now, if we follow the blue line up in my diagram, yep. we can see, as we follow it up, we eventually hit this transaction Manage management space. service, yep. okay? Now, if I zoom out, you'll see the scale of my problem. From a single API call, mm -hmm. I'm hitting everything below that management service. So I'm hitting... The user is not waiting anymore, Paul, right? Like the user left, right? Right. So what, what's happening here is I've got I've got two scenarios, okay? I've With regards to eventing, I've mm. got scenario one is I want the lines in the database... I want to raise an event to say these lines are in the database. I want to wait for the transaction headers to be created. I want to put those transaction header IDs on the lines, and then I want to return the line blob that was given to me from the caller. Right. That one aids with testing to ensure that I've created those transactions as expected. Right. Um, but also, too, gives in the real world, in production, for example, it gives the client some confidence that they've, they've got tracking IDs for those transactions that I've created in my system, okay? Right. So for that first event scenario, all of that, I would say 
when I create those transactions, I'm creating those transactions on behalf of the user. So you could argue the system is the actual user, I guess, right? Beca because it's happening on the other side of an event, right? Right. But a, the there's a created by field on the invoice, which I want to be that user, which comes from my authentication information. Mm. Now, if you consider when I go into so if I zoom in on specifically invoices, okay, I've got this invoice orchestration service, which is going to receive anything that I do with invoices as a request. Why should the fact that that request has come from an event be any different to it having come from a request? That's my logic here. So I want to have one add an invoice method in my controller that can do a security check. And it doesn't matter if I'm inside a HTTP request or I'm outside of that and on the other side of an event, the user is the user. They've, as a side effect, they've triggered this behavior. They're the ones that asked me to do this. And if you think about it from a business user point of view, when they're then looking at the data, and they're looking at their thousands of transactions that they dumped in a CSV blob through a daily import. They want to see their name on it. I was the user that did that. They don't want to see system did this for you. They want to see I did this. So, so. <laughs> I realized that, you know, when we put, when we say, hey, the user didn't do this, the system did it. What we're saying here is, the technology works a certain way. We're letting the computer dictate to us what's actually going on. When in actual fact, what we want to do is propagate user context throughout the entire life cycle of a complex user operation. You're not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> yeah. are, we, are we not mixing two things here in your explanation, Paul? It sounds like um, well, you're doing, uh, Authentication so you know said, again in your in your, in your uh, authorization broker then. Because so you know you, I if... said there's there's two scenarios, right? Mm. So the invoice goes in after hitting this invoice orchestration service, right? But then the header being created triggers another event. User doesn't care about waiting for that, but that's creating all of the parts that make up the children of that invoice. Right. What they want is the transaction IDs in the response. So to my mind, there's events that I wait for and there's events that I don't. And the one and in either case, everything that happened as part of the entire event chain happened as that user. So from a security point of view, it's one scenario from a how the event is handled and whether or not I wait for it. There are two different scenarios. And there's also within pub sub when we're talking about things like service bus implementations there's the um i can have one event raised many subscribers all have to handle it or i can have one event raised one of the many subscribers has to handle it and so that configurability also causes further complication in eventing as a problem so my thinking was if eventing as a problem was just here's a request into some code. And no matter how I receive the request, if there's some way that I can trust something that's going to provide me with security information about who the user is, I don't have to care about that in my business logic. So when I'm writing my service code in the standard, I write the same code regardless. And my authorization broker, the thing that's actually responsible for making security decisions, just derives that from current context somehow. So what I'm trying to figure out here is the somehow, right? If I have a HTTP request, it's pretty cut and dry. I can go to the request. I can get the auth token from the auth token. I can get the single sign-on user ID from the single sign-on user ID. I can make an informed decision. So, if I'm not in a request, I don't have that. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. Actually, Krista, go ahead first. I know you have a thought on this, and then I'll, I'll go after. Go ahead. So it sounds to me that like there's there's two things then in, in the mix on, on on paul's scenario so um back to what i said before i think if you pass in your claims principle down the line you you've already got that that authorization information that you can derive how you want to time uh, timestamp and uh, label the user that created or updated it um in terms of the user context i think so claims um, principle in this case is single sign-on user ID, right? 
Yeah, so it's, it's the same same claims from that you would have get from your HTTP uh, context assessor. So as I you don't say, use that. yeah, I know you don't use that, but <laughs> in in your your authentication process, you, yeah. you you sort of get that information by um, picking it up from your CSV process. So I think we can separate that because you can follow a flow where you say, okay, I I pick a client's uh, file up from a specific drop folder. Um, I can then uh, construct a, a, a claims principle from that information to correctly represent the user. And then that claims principle, well, then you fi finished with uh, authentication. Mm -hmm. And then as part of the authorization, you can send that claims principle all the way down the line through your process. And uh, um, those so two is then actually two separate processes. So. so you would have in your eventing library, you'd pass in a, say, an I claims principle implementation through the yeah. event. Yeah. Yeah. So what? So the idea that I had was the eventing libraries implementation would do that. So let's say I have an event of type T, okay, um, where I've got I'm going to raise events where T is my my entity type that I'm interested in transmitting over the event. So you know I'm going to add T's. I'm going to update T's. Right. So I'm going to have events for this kind of thing. So what you would do is you would have like a message of type T effectively, where um, it contains a T and an I claims principle. And then you transmit that over your service bus. And then on the other end, you would do what? Well, you've got you've got your user information, <laughs> you've got your claims and your roles. So if you need to do any logical validation, like is the user in the role, can, can I update it or uh, in a sense, uh, I've got my entity. Um, the person that submitted it is now the same person trying to approve it. Uh, we can't allow that. So you can do that type of logic, uh, but you don't have to, to do the authentication bit again. You don't have to reevaluate. Uh, is that user on my system still? Is 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 it uh, a valid uh, uh, expiry criteria or anything like that? Ah, so 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 Paul, I think what Chris was going for is that the the authentication part is done you don't have to redo that the authorization part is where he goes and says okay i know there is a person who's authorized to access this app i just care about what they are you know uh, uh, sorry authenticate into the app i want to know sorry what uh, what kind of roles and what kind of permissions do they have so yes. i can validate whether they can do and by the way i want you to get rid of the idea of user because it can be user or a system right so there's yes. a role we're dealing with roles right we're dealing with roles we're dealing with certain uh, capabilities that are allowed or not allowed to whatever entity is sitting on the other side because once you start eventing it doesn't really matter whether it's a real person sitting on the other side or not your auth broker is supposed to be telling you hey for this current id or this current context that you're in here's what's allowed and here's what's not and then you yeah, determine and, and that's that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So the authentication piece, figuring out who the user is, for example. And I, I know you want me to sort of forget about users and, and things at this point, but it's kind of like um, my business logic, for example, is if I receive, say, an invoice through a HTTP request, the business logic is going to say, OK, the, the user that created that is the one that um, is associated with that bearer auth token, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to single sign and I'm going to say, who is this user? And I'm going to get their user ID and I'm going to stick that in a field on the invoice. And then I'm going to pass that down the chain. And that's right. going to, and that's what's going to end up in the database. So what I'm saying here is if I've got an HTTP request, it's pretty cut and dry, exactly how that works. Dead simple, standard logic. Everybody does that all the time. If I've got the same piece of logic called on the other side of an event, because it's it's been called as the result of an event handler, the way that I derive who the current user is has to change. Right. And the problem that I'm having is, as you can see in my diagram, right? So imagine that, that this logic here, right, is called in these two different scenarios. Right, right. One's, one's in a HTTP request and one's as a result of an event. In both scenarios, I go down the same logical chain of services. In both scenarios, I end up in an authorization broker 
asking, hey, can the current user or can whoever the current user is in the current context do operation? Yeah. What, what, However, what, I define that. Do you do you do you do you break the circuit when a user is not authorized, or you just let every event handler deal with its own problems? Uh, I would throw a security exception, and then it right. Really but do you cut the chain. circuit? Okay, so just hear me out. So you have you pushed an event, right? Yeah. Five different threads were born out of it, just kind of spawn out of it, right? One of them is cutting the circuit. One of them is saying, "Hey, this user is not authorized to do that." Does that impact or inflict on others in any way, shape, or form? The other in, four. In in line with the spirit of the the standard, I would say every service makes its own or decision. Itself. That's, yeah. that's it. So, the, so okay. the priv check that's done in each, let's say, um, you know, five um, orchestration services ultimately receive this event notification, right? Each orchestration service might ask, okay, for this this user, I want this particular priv, which is specific to me. Mm -hmm. um, does this user have this privilege? And if if they don't have this privilege, I'm going to throw a security exception. If they do then I go ahead and I process the operation. So a single HTTP request in my case might hit 50,000 lines of code and require 20 different privileges. And yeah, if, yeah. if the user has 19 of them, then let's say, I don't know, 19 of the, for a given transaction, yeah, 19 out of the 20 rows get added to the database and the other one throws an exception. So, so now hear me out. <clears throat> Just just before you pull yourself into some weird matrix and we have to wrap up because we're at time, but you know, listen to me. You know, if if certain events should not exist or should not happen without certain events happening, you can't use eventing in that case. You just can't. You have to build them, you have to intertwine their fate. You have to basically go and say, No, here's a, a coordination service with two orchestration services because it's one item potent process. But because I don't want you to end up in a situation where you're creating an invoice, but there's no credit or something like that. Like, I'm just giving you an example. It's like saying, you know, all hats and no cattle, like they say in Montana, like someone wearing a cowboy hat, but there's no cows. You know, so what does that even mean? It doesn't make any sense, right? So so listen, this is this is a great discussion, but I have to step out. I want us to continue this discussion. I think I think your point here is clear. I wanted you to talk about spawning up services you know, based on the request, but we're out of time. Uh, oh, let's, yeah. You didn't let's, even get to that. <laughs> so. That's literally why I want, but anyway, it's okay. Uh, let's let's sync up again. I might even do like a, you know, a temporary other, you know, standard discussion even before Tuesday because there's so many different topics that we want to talk about. It's like I was telling Evan yesterday, I was telling him this is like a long-running hackathon. Um Let's circle back on this, okay? This is this is something great, and I want the community to kind of engage in this and try to kind of think think with us about these problems because this is legit. This is this is a legit real life business problem, you know, and we need to kind of think about about the solution. Anyway, at the end, I I want to thank you all for joining me today. This is great. Uh, sorry for the you know I need I need to make these uh, these sessions a little bit longer, you know, because uh, because usually you know you know. One hour is not really enough, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to push it up a little bit one hour earlier. Can all of you do like an hour earlier since they changed the <laughs> they changed? I, I think they changed the time zones for you too, Paul. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if you can do it a little bit earlier. I'll try to do my best from this side. Uh, but uh, thank you all for joining in today, and uh, you know, let's let's sync up again too. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for Cheers, guys. Thanks. Cool. Cheers. And Sharaf has been waiting. Thank you, Sharaf. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take care. <laughs>